having a few technical problems with the images. Can we go back to the first image, please, that says the sacred headwaters? Uh, we have no remote, so you'll see me pointing a lot. You know, often many of you have heard me come and talk about distant realms in my work as an explorer and residence of the National Geographic, but I decided to speak um, about my own home for once. Uh, and I want to begin by thinking and encouraging you to think about this idea of space, spirit of place, memory, uh, and how quickly we forget. How many of us, for example, know that in the lifetime of your own great-grandfathers, passenger pigeons, for example, made up 40% of all birds in North America. Flocks were so dense that Audubon described them literally eclipsing the sun over the city of Cincinnati. When one of those flocks that contained two and three billion birds would land on a bit of woodland, the trees would break off like toothpicks from the sheer weight of, of wildlife. Uh, summer landscapes would become winter landscapes by the sheer accumulation of guano. And from that height of those populations to their final extinction was less than a generation. Pigeon meat was the mainstay of the American diet, and those who could afford to eat beef killed their birds for sport. It was nothing for a gentleman's shooting club in New York to catapult 55,000 birds to their death uh, before diminishing supplies forced us in that sport to turn to clay pigeons. The concept of the stool pigeon in English comes from a killing technique of the era. You would capture a bird, sew its eyelids shut, tie its legs to a pole, its cries of grief would bring in the birds in such abundance that the hunters simply batted them out of the sky. Or how about the buffalo? In 1871, buffalo outnumbered people in North America. You could stand on a, on a, on a bluff anywhere in the Dakotas and see nothing but individual herds of cattle out of buffalo that covered the horizon. Um, and from the height of their population to their final reduction to a zoological curiosity, it was only seven years. Uh, it was explicit policy of the U.S. cavalry to deny the Great Plains cultures their commissary. And when the final buffalo was reduced to a shadow on the prairie, and when the last of the great nations were reduced to the reservations, Philip Sheridan, who had orchestrated the campaign, recommended to the U.S. Congress that a commemorative medal be minted that would have on the one side of it a dead buffalo, and on the other side a dead Indian. I recently made an IMAX film in the Grand Canyon with my good friend Bobby Kennedy and our daughters. And here's the Grand Canyon. Five million people visit it every year. 27,000 people go down it every year. Its, control is, its flow is controlled by technicians at one of 11 dams. Or Yosemite. When John Muir walked into Yosemite in 1868, he found a pristine paradise. Well, today, every night, 15,000 people camp in Yosemite Valley. Every year, it's visited by the equivalent population of Los Angeles. Uh, there are 23,000 criminal events occur there every summer and 600, 600 car accidents. And how often do we think, oh, wouldn't it be cool to go back and know Yosemite as Muir did, or to know the Grand Canyon before it was stifled by dams? The, the answer is that you can, and you can experience it in the same way that you can go back in time and make sure that the Glen Canyon was not violated with the construction of that dam. There is a place in Canada where you can go experience land like that, and protect it, and it's called the Sacred Headwaters. Can we go, and what we're going to try to do here without a remote is, I, let's just put the slides on, a, just every 10 seconds, show a picture. That'll work. Uh, this is the most extraordinary place in Canada. Of course, you've sent, keep, uh, keep going through these images as, as you can. Um, there's a lot of them to get through. Um, <clears throat> the, the, um, John Muir actually visited the northwest quadrant of British Columbia in 1879. He went up one of the three great rivers, the Stikine, for a third of its length. He was so enamored, he called it a Yosemite, 150 miles long, and he named his dog after the river. Our greatest canyon in Canada, that most Canadians don't even know the name of, the Grand Canyon of the Stikine, is a K2 of whitewater challenges, and in um, all of history, less than 50 individuals have ever gotten through it. You look on the map of the United States in the lower continental 48, the furthest you can get away from the maintained road is 20 miles. The northwest quadrant of British Columbia, an area the size of Oregon, has one road, a narrow ribbon of asphalt that slips up the coastal mountains to the Yukon. John Muir never got beyond the Grand Canyons to Keene, so he never saw the great heights of the Zaitza, the sacred mountain of the Taltan. He never saw the depths of the Grand Canyon where hundreds of mountain goats escape predation by crawling down these extraordinary cliffs. Maybe go a little faster with those images so we can get through them. Uh, 
He never saw the upper reaches of the Spatsizi and the Stikine, where the Serengeti of Canada is nurtures the greatest wildlife populations in um, North America. And most assuredly, he never, please go a little bit faster. And I should say, these images are from a book coming out called The Sacred Headwaters, where the in International League of Conservation Photographers um, sends five of the top photographers of the world to a threatened area. Now, this area here is the Sacred Headwaters. No, I'm not that fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. <laughs> no, we um, but th the reason we call it the Sacred Headwaters is because an extraordinary miracle of geography happens there. Three of Canada's most important salmon rivers, the Stikine, the Nass, and the um, Skeena, all by uh, remarkable um, accident of geography, are born in the same meadows. Now, those meadows are known to the First Nations as the Sacred Headwaters. And the only place in the world where I know where such a miracle occurs is on the slopes of Mount Kailash in Tibet that gives birth to the Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Ganga, and the Sutle River. Now, that area is considered so sacrosanct to two and three billion Jains and Buddhists and Hindus who live downstream that not only are you not allowed to climb Mount Kailash, you can't set foot on it. And the idea of imposing industrial infrastructure in those meadows that give birth to those sacred rivers would be considered so anathema that it would condemn your family and your lineage for all time. In Canada, of course, we treat the land very differently. Uh, the Sacred Headwaters is now, is now under assault from any number of uh, directions. Royal Dutch Shell is proposing to put 6,000 coal bed methane extractive wellheads in a network of pipes that would extract from every wellhead the equivalent of three Olympic swimming pools of toxic water, even as they would frack the coal seams by massive injections of 350,000 gallons of benzene and diesel injected like a hypodermic syringe into the very meadows that give birth to the salmon rivers of home. Um, a company called Imperial Metals proposes to extract 30,000 tons of riprap and rock every day from the top of a sacred mountain known to the tall town as Potagon. It's the home to the greatest population of stone sheep on earth. Uh, that mine would create uh, acid leaching that would go into the headwaters of the Iskid River, flowing into the Stikine, have to be treated for 200 years. Uh, Fortune Minerals, a company based here in London, Ontario, proposes to rip into the heart of the sacred headwaters itself, leveling entire mountains to extract anthracite coal, a deposit that it proposes to uh, produce up to 3 million uh, tons every year, which would mean that every seven minutes a 40-ton lorry would be driving down the sacred headwaters, del delivering anthracite coal to the Asian markets. That photograph there is according to Imperial Metals, not a lake. That is going to be a tailings pond that will drain into this lake chain here that goes into this lake Totogan, uh, Totoga. Keep going. Which takes you into Kiniskan. These are the sacred headwaters over the greatest waterfall of the north, and finally into the Iskid itself. Now, environmental considerations aside, think of what this tells us of ourselves as Canadians. What, after all, does it take to put together a mining initiative in Canada? Well, you get together in a place like London, Ontario, or Toronto. You cobble together a company with less history than my dog. You get online and secure the subsurface rights to a place that you've never been, the stories of which you've never heard, the pain of a long winter you've never experienced, nor the promise of a bright spring. And as long as you can guarantee the government a certain revenue flow, either in the form of taxation or royalty, you by definition secure the right to transform that place for all time. Now, the fascinating thing about that logic is that there's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that takes into account or places any value whatsoever on the land left alone. And inversely, there is not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes that devastation. Hold it right there. On the cost to the destruction of that, of that place. Now we take that as a given because that's the way you industrialize the wild in Canada. But if you think about it in terms of the, through the anthropological lens, it's highly anomalous behavior. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a little bit like you're selling roses from your garden here in London, Ontario. And, you know, I come along to buy your roses. And, and in one transaction, I decide to buy all your roses. And you think it's been a great afternoon. But as I walk away with your bundle of roses and you've got $50 in your pocket, I say, by the way, I'm destroying your house. And you say, wait a minute. Well, what are you going to compensate me for the house? No, no, I'm buying roses here. I'm getting coal here. I'm getting coal bed methane gas here. I'm getting copper here. 
I, I, the, the fact that in doing so I'm going to destroy your house is your problem. Well, that's essentially how the structure of this exists in our worldview, and that's not the way the First Nations view it. There are 4,000 copper mines in the world. There are some places to put them and some places not to put them. And to put a copper mine on top of the mountain that's home to the largest population of stone and sheep in the world is like drilling for oil in the Sistine Chapel. And the thing that I find fascinating about this is that there's this extraordinary disconnect. I remember once I was in a neighboring lodge uh, and sort of a fly on the wall where I overheard this conversation. And it used to be you could recognize these engineers because I used to be one. We always had fluorescent vests and hard hats and steel-toed boots. Now everybody looks like they come out of a fucking Patagonian clothing catalog. <laughs> and they're in fleece and all these outfits and everything. And there's this one character over here having a cup of coffee and this wonderful woman walks in and they're breathless with awe. And this is how their conversation went. Wow. And of course they, I knew that the woman in question had just come down from this sacred mountain. Wow, did you see it? Yeah, wow. I've never seen so much wildlife. No, I mean, you see the sheep? Did you see the wolves? Up with the grizzly bear? Yeah, I've never seen yeah, yeah, What? You ever been up here before? No, no, never north of Prince George. How about, no, I, got, I never got north of Whaley Inside. It's the most incredible place I've ever seen. Well, that conversation was being held between the assistant deputy minister of mines and the chief engineer for Imperial Metals who were there with the collective bureaucratic and corporate mission to destroy that place. And the irony didn't even seem to fit in on them. And so that's what really we're trying to do, because for the First Nations, like the Taltan, the Gitsan, the Wet'suwet'en, the Carrier, the Nishka, these aren't rivers. Uh, these are the arteries of life. These are the arteries that brought forth and cradled the great civilization of the Pacific Northwest Coast. These are the peoples who have stood up now for five years blockading their roads, saying simply no to imperial metals, no to shell, and no to fortune. And the extraordinary thing is that magic has happened. So for example, the first year of the blockades, everybody was a little grumbling because the, you know, it was July month, and that's when everybody likes to be fishing for sockeye. And so everybody was kind of like uptight because they were on the barricades, but they, you know, they couldn't be fishing. And so what should happen, but suddenly this big, massive double trailer truck comes roaring down the Stuart Cancer Highway and conveniently has an accident right at the site of the blockade. And guess what it turns out to be having in its back, and it was it hauling down to Seattle, hundreds of tons of fresh Alaska spring salmon. So the salmon came to the blockade site and the forest became a kind of kaleidoscope of drying fish. So, our feeling in British Columbia is that we're launching this massive campaign. We have a book coming out next year, keep going now, uh, called The Sacred Headwaters. We have brought together the finest photographers in the world uh, because this is an area that simply has to be saved. You know, it's interesting. International tourism is a $4.5 trillion business. Uh, the entire capitalization of every mining company in the world is less than a billion dollars, less than a trillion dollars. Uh, you know, a trillion dollars is a pile of a thousand dollar banknotes, roughly a uh, billion dollars roughly is, is roughly um, 248 feet high. A trillion dollars is a pile of 67.8 uh, miles high. So the levels of scale are incredible. And as, you know, working for the National Geographic as I do, uh, I travel all around the world, sometimes to 40 or 50 countries a year, and I can assure you that these kinds of wild places are becoming extraordinarily and increasingly rare in the world. This sacred headwaters is a place that should be the sacred headwaters of all Canadians. And so we're asking through appearances like this or through the social media, the only thing that's going to save this place is if Canadian people stand up and say that this is intolerable. And one of the things that makes it most intolerable, and again, unknown to most Canadians, is that mines such as the one that Imperial Metals plans to put on top of or tends to put on top of Tottegan Mountain, by the admission of the mine itself, can only go ahead with subsidized power. And the government of both British Columbia and the federal government of Canada have decided to do precisely that. And at the cost of $400 million, uh, extend the grid of BC Hydro up the Stuart Cassier Highway, specifically to bring power to these mines. And one of the most cynical elements of that is that $130 million of that, which has come out of your pocket, has come out of the fund that was set aside by the federal government to green the Canadian economy. 
So your tax dollars, intended to green our economy, are actually being used to extend a hydro line which, which will allow a mediocre mine to go into production, which will pollute the headwaters of the sake of all these rivers, and in fact to, to allow coal bed methane extraction to go in to a place where that should never happen. And if we allow that to occur in Canada, I think it would be an extraordinarily shameful thing. So please pay attention uh, to the publication of the book, The Sacred Headwaters. It will be the most extraordinary collection of imagery uh, I think that has ever been compiled in Canada. And I think if we work together, we can truly make this a sacred headwaters, not only of all Canadians, but of all people in the world. Thanks very much.